I knew I would forget something. Real quick, I want to introduce to you guys the leaders who were over my students this weekend. Uh, Corey, stand up, girl. Come on. Carmen, <laughs> Anthony, and Zach. Three of these students are associated with Kilgore College. Are y'all all active students? Yes, all active students. And uh, that college has just got a wealth of great, great kids that come through the BSMs. M many of y'all may not know this, but our church cooks uh, lunch for them on a Tuesday every year. And I get to go over there and hang out with them. This past uh, the Tuesday, a couple of weeks ago, we served over 200 kids in that place. It was amazing. Our Miss Patsy and our kitchen crew just do a fantastic job of preparing for that. But these guys are amazing. They encourage my heart because Jesus is still alive and he's still at work in generations. He is. Thank you guys so much. Uh, our speaker this morning, Sovereign Love Dixon. He's the pastor of a church on Pine Tree Road, a little road off Pine Tree called Sovereign Love. And uh, folks, he ministers to people that many of us would question walking in the doors of this church. He reaches out to some folks that are really bound up and struggling, atheist, in the gay lifestyle, you name it. And this guy... His heart is nothing but God's love. He showed that to us all weekend long. He's all about God's love. He's just blown away with God's love, and that's just how he shares with folks. So we're blessed this morning to have him come and speak for us. So come on, brother. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Testing, got this right? Okay. Not used to this, so bear with me here. The love of God is, is a message that's always been near and dear to my heart. And growing up, I went to White Oak uh, all my life. And so, um, White Oak people in here, yes? Awesome, awesome. Uh, White Oak's born and raised. Uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ on September 3rd, 1998 at a Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames presentation at Marbury Baptist Church. At that moment, um, I knew that Christ was my Lord and Savior. Didn't really know what that looked like ultimately, uh, what it meant to, to follow him. It was two years before I got baptized, but as soon as I got baptized, I knew I was getting involved in ministry and just seeking to live for him. The, the message that has been throughout the, the core of my existence has been that, that doctrine of the love of God. And I don't know what you guys struggle with theologically. Um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's parts of scripture and certain attributes of God that we just struggle with. And that's completely cool. Um, the doctrine that I have struggled with most throughout my life has been the love of God. And the reason I say that is when I think of the cross and I look at, at what Jesus did there on that cross, I, I just put the pieces out there. Now, let's be honest here. Jesus is the eternal son of being. Jesus Jesus. From the very beginning, Jesus was with God the Father and the Holy Spirit before we were even around. Before this world was in existence, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the, the blessed Trinity that we sang about was enjoying the company of one another. And there was love between the Father and the Son and love between the Spirit and the, the Son and the Father. There's a lie out there that says that God created man because he was lonely. It's not true. God wasn't lonely. But God created us for his glory. 
And he created this world knowing that the people that he created were going to fall into sin. And he created us anyway. And when he sent his son to become flesh among us, he knew exactly what was going to happen. And Jesus went to that, lived that sinless life, went to that cross, and died for us. For us. Scripture says that we are worth our weight in gold. We're not going to take a scale out here and weigh everyone, but you guys are worth a whole lot. And Scripture says that the faith that you have adds to that worth. That's huge, guys. But no matter, if we were to add up all of our weights, which would be pretty heavy, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about anyone here, but I'm just saying, if we add up all of our weights together, combined, I, I couldn't lift that. No one in this room could lift that. But still, the worth of all of us put together we're not worth collectively altogether more than Jesus is. You add up all of humanity throughout time from the creation of the world to now, all of our collective worth, and Jesus is still worth a whole lot more. Yet Jesus came to that cross and died for us so that we could be reconciled to God. That blows me away. Suffering. And on that cross, I don't just see Jesus suffering the physical pain. I think a lot of times we just leave that idea there that, you know, Jesus is just on the cross and it's physical pain and let's look at the physical pain and, and, and yeah, that would be very difficult to endure. But that was only part of the pain that Jesus suffered. And I don't think it was the greatest pain. There was also the pain for the first time in all of history that something was going on there. Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. I think about all of the sins that I have committed in my life before my salvation and also all those after my salvation. And I'm probably going to commit a lot more sin in my lifetime, let's just be honest. Jesus took all of those. And when I think of my sin, that's a whole lot more than I can count. And if we were to just, in this building, add up all of our sins that we have just committed already in our lifetime, that's a lot of sin. And Jesus is on the cross bearing our sin. There's some spiritual pain going on. And there's also that aspect of, for the first time in all of history, there's that statement that Jesus makes, and I struggled with this statement for years until it finally came down upon me and it just changed my life. But when Jesus said that statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That bugged me, guys. That bugged me a lot because I was scratching my head doing the Columbo thing and I was like, why would God forsake Jesus? That, that doesn't sound like something a loving father would do. But then I realized that Jesus had to be forsaken so that I could be forgiven. I think the greatest pain on the cross was when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time in all of, all of eternity, there was silence between the Father and the Son. That had to have been the most awkward, weighty silence in all of history. And Jesus endured that for us. Not because we're worth more than Jesus, but because Jesus willingly wanted to lay down his life for us out of love. And he has a plan for 
for all of us. And he loves us so much. He pours out so much of his life. This morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 7. Those are big steps. This is a story that often gets mixed up with other accounts in Scripture. But we're going to be in Luke 7, 36 through 50. This is the only time in Scripture that this, is, this account is mentioned. Now, there's a similar account uh, that happens the Passover week, and it happens in Bethany. This is in Galilee. Uh, the guy whose house this is, this is Simon the Pharisee's house. On Passion Week in Bethany, that was the house of Simon the leper, two completely different people. Similar occurrences, but different uh, places in the timeline, different people completely. Verse 36 reads, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon answered, Say it, teacher. And Jesus said, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50 When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Such an amazing account of Scripture. And we read accounts like this, and so often we really miss the picture of what's really happening here. Some of you guys are, are wrapped up on, well, this is a really sinful woman, but hey, it, look at the Pharisee. Uh, Jesus is spending time with, with both the Pharisee and the sinful woman. Two pictures which could be viewed as, as extremes. God is willing to spend time with both the sinful woman, and the Pharisee. If we back up a little before this text, we see Jesus talking about John the Baptist, and we see Jesus making a statement that he is, uh, he's seen as as a drunkard and hanging out with sinners and, and things of that nature. 
Jesus really wasn't worried about his reputation. Jesus just wanted to love people. No matter who they were, no matter where they're at, he wanted to love them. Cultural norms were completely demolished with Jesus. When Jesus went to the woman at the well, that was a big no-no. You don't do that. Jesus did it anyway. Jesus was willing to be seen with people who were not like him. He was willing to be seen with people who were sinners. And he was willing to be seen with people who were the Pharisees as well. Both parties. And at the heart of that, you have this love that none of us are perfect in. None of us in here has arrived at mastering loving others as Jesus has. I struggle with it daily. But it's what we're called to do as Christians. I am convicted that we hear so many things in this world from, from the news media, from, uh, from different books that we read, from friends, family, we don't hear enough from Jesus himself. We're supposed to be followers of Christ and walking in his footsteps, displaying the love of God to the world. But what is that love supposed to look like? What is that love supposed to look like? The passage that I try to let guide my life, this is the passage that I place before me every single day, and I have to do a spiritual check with it. And that's Corinthians 13. We say, we say this all the time. It's on bookmarks. It's on bumper stickers. Uh, our culture has it everywhere. Every wedding I hear this passage. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Go back with me to Luke 7 here. Knowing what we know about the Pharisees, what type of people they were, I think it's safe to say that no one in here, in their right mind, would want to be a Pharisee. Nor would anyone in their right mind want to be in the place of the sinful woman in her sins. Two places we, we wouldn't want to be. Jesus knew what was in the heart of the sinful woman and Jesus knew what was in the heart of the Pharisee. And according to what we know about Simon the Pharisee, he was probably looking to, to trap Jesus. But Jesus spent time with him anyway. 
Very interesting picture. Why do you think Jesus did that? Why would Jesus spend time with someone who may not come to faith in him? The same reason why it rains upon the just and the unjust. God has a common grace that pours out over all humanity. Everyone in this world experiences the love of God in some way, shape, or form. Not the salvific love of God as far as a relationship with Christ that only Christians experience. It is everyone knows enough of the love of God. They know that God is out there, that there is something out there that created this world. They know it. Romans 1, 2, and 3 says that clearly. And we learn in Romans 2 that it is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And so God continually pours out kindness to us, hoping that we'll repent, giving us that option to repent. It's the heart of God. He gave that chance to the Pharisee and to the sinful woman. Huge. What does that mean for us? There's people in all of our lives that some of them we, we find difficult to love. Some of them have have sins that they do not look like our sins. Not too long ago, I was talking with a student who asked me a question about his girlfriend who was into bestiality. That's never been my problem. But there are people out there whose problem that is. There's people out there who struggle with homosexuality. There's people out there who, some from, from my group, who, who have had a sex reassignment surgery, and, and they struggle with that. They struggle with, did I make the wrong decision? And what does it look like now in my life? Sometimes these are hard, hard things to deal with because it's not just a one-time moment where uh, I'm going to say a prayer with someone and then pass them on their way, but I've got to do life with this person. I've got to love this person. And the love that we've got to love them with cannot be cheap. It's got to be costly. Because when we show a cheapened form of love, That's not what God has given us. That's not really picturesque of the cross. The God who has saved us. And we, we think of salvation sometimes as a one-time thing that, you know, God, God saves us, but in all honesty, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a process that's going on in our life. This process of sanctification we are being conformed to the image of Christ, according to Romans 8, 28 through 30. And there's some things that we have experienced. We can say confidently that if we are a believer in Jesus Christ, that we have been predestined, we have been called, we have been justified. There's one thing we really can't say, according to Romans 8, 28 through 30, and that is glorified. That is something we look forward to, though. When we have, when Christ returns and we are given a glorified body, what that's going to look like, I have no clue. But we're going to have that glorified body. We're not yet complete, but one day we will be. One of my friends, um, one of his statements says, we're not all there, but it's our job to get us there, to get us all there. The beautiful picture of the church 
which I think this is something that is hugely missed in, in many churches throughout our land. In the early church, what happened was people came together and one of the things they did on a regular basis was they confessed their sins both to God and to one another. To God and to one another. Well, what does that look like? Well, what that looks like is us opening up about the sin in our life with people in our own congregation that we trust. Not just the pastor or the leaders, but to one another. Well, wh what's that for? It's for several reasons. One, we're not meant to bear these burdens alone. We're put together in this environment so that we can be, if we all know the love of God, then there's not a sin in here that can be brought up that another believer in Christ shouldn't be able to handle. We can forgive one another. Uh, last night at the D-Now, I spoke on reconciliation and spoke from one of my favorite passages, which is Genesis 32 and 33. That morning, we talked on Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord and what that looked like and, and the amazing picture there. And then we trekked that night into Genesis 33, and we saw there in that text that all that night before, Jacob was really struggling with seeing his brother the next day. Because he knew Esau was, was pretty upset with him. And so he was doing all this, uh, sending these camels and these cows and all these gifts uh, ahead of him, hoping that these kind acts will soften the heart of his brother. And he was afraid. But when he saw the face of his brother Esau, who Esau actually ran and embraced him. He said that it was like seeing the face of God and being accepted. When I first read that, like read it, read it for the first time, like really saw that phrase and really it got a hold of me, wept in tears. Amazing picture of reconciliation. There's a story that, when I was sharing that, I used the story about a friend of mine who her dad had sexually abused her growing up. Not an easy story. Not an easy situation. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what she did? She said, I've got I've to forgive my dad. You know what she did? She forgave her dad. And we're not talking about a cheap form of forgiveness. You may have heard about cheap grace and, well, there's cheap love and there's cheap forgiveness. I mean, there's a lot of things cheap and we can't make things cheap. It's costly. She forgave her dad and she, on Father's Day, on Christmas, on his birthday, just out of the clear blue, goes eat, eats with him, hangs out with him, loves him, counts the sin that he committed against her no more, just like God. Well, that's really tough. That's, that's a, uh, that's, what about boundaries and all that kind of stuff? Well, what does God do? What has God called us to do? One last text, I'm going to tie all of this together. When Paul is expounding upon this, this common thread that Jesus has taught us by his life, 
and he's talking about what it looks like to be, to be Christians. Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. Station of what forgiveness. Not just forgive one another, and we're going to leave that to your interpretation of what forgiveness means. No, there's a qualifier here. Forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. Wow. If you're looking, if you struggle with the issue of forgiveness, if you're like, I just struggle with forgiving this person over here, there's a great book by Nancy Leda Moss called Choosing Forgiveness, Your Journey Toward Freedom. Highly recommend that book. We'll probably have to order it because uh, it doesn't stay on the shelf very much, but it is amazing. And on a side note, if you're struggling with the idea of forgiving yourself, that's found nowhere in the Bible. We are to accept the forgiveness of God, and that's supposed to be enough for us. She talks about that in that book. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. It is the love of God that's supposed to be the driving factor of everything that we do. We are to be a people of reconciliation. We're not to be a people of judgment. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, let's be honest, the church at Corinth had a lot of internal problems. There was a lot of things going on in the church at Corinth that shouldn't have been going on. A lot of really big sin issues. And when Paul was talking to them, he talked about that within the context of the church, we've got to to judge one another. We've got to hold one another accountable. How does that work? We share our sins with one another. I would encourage you guys, open up with one another. People that you trust with inside y'all's church. And if there's a sin that you've struggled with for years, maybe that's the reason you haven't found victory in that area. Maybe the reason why you haven't reconciled with that family member, that mother, that father, that brother, that sister, is because you haven't taken the step. Accept me to reach out. They may not accept me. They may not really want to, to receive the forgiveness or give the forgiveness not our place we're to love people no matter what whether they want our love or not could that be painful probably is Jacob if you go back and read Genesis 32 he was he was so afraid to see his brother he didn't know what was going to happen but he did it anyway And it doesn't matter what kind of person they are. Jesus loved the Pharisee, and he loved the sinful woman. The sinful woman, from what we know, it looks like she was a prostitute. She had a lot going on in her life. Can you love people who don't look like you? Can you love the transgender community? Can you love homosexuals? Can you love adulterers? Can you love people that don't look like you? People who are completely tattooed up? 
people who uh, have so many different addictions going on in their life. This woman, when she came to Jesus, she did not have her life together. But she was broken. And there's something beautiful that God sees about someone who's broken. And that's something we all need to, to pray for. We need to pray that we would have that heart like Jesus. Because if we don't have the heart like Jesus, if we do not start loving like Jesus Christ loved, then can we really bear the name of Christ? Can we really claim in the spirit of Corinthians 5 that we are ambassadors for Christ, that we are ministry that we are ministers of reconciliation that we have the ministry of reconciliation that's our calling and what that means is not just the relationships that are broken in my life but the relationships that are broken in other people's lives i need to commit and pray for those relationships there's a girl recently who shared with me about a relationship with her aunt and her uncle that was non-existent. Back in January, when we started praying for that. January of last year, we started praying for that, and about four or five months in, you know what happened? Reconciliation. They're meeting up, they're talking about books, they're having coffee. Hadn't done that in over 10 years, but now it's a regular occurrence. They're Facebooking, they're Snapchatting. I still haven't figured out Snapchat. It's okay. Te technology challenges all of us at times. But we love. My challenge to you guys tonight, this morning, I'm sorry, I forget what time it is. My challenge to you guys this morning is to love like Jesus. However that looks in your life, there's some people in here who are probably thinking of a certain name of a family member or a friend or a coworker that maybe you need to get right with. Confess it to God and then make it right with them. This time if the worship leader will, will come up, I am not someone who's really big on, on altar calls. But I want to share one little story um, and then just leave this altar as a place to pray. And if there's anything that you need to get right, if you need to talk to someone, uh, if you need to make something right with someone on the other side, go ahead and go talk to them. But if maybe you're in that situation where maybe you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, Guys, you cannot forgive others like God has called you to forgive others unless you first receive the forgiveness that God has given. The real altar call that is existent in all of our lives is going to be what we do from this moment on and are we going to walk down the aisle of talking to that family member or talking to that, that broken relationship elsewhere. That's the real challenge. And that's what loving like Jesus really looks like. Last story, real fast. So I wasn't going to share this, but this is something that uh, someone made a comment about martyrdom earlier, and it reminded me of this book, and there's a story that I just have to share. This is Eusebius Ecclesiastical History, which is really the first church history textbook. It's regarded for those history buffs. Uh, on up there with the level of Josephus and Philo. But there's a story in here, and what they did is they took like early writings within the church, and this is a story, just a testimony that I just had to share. John, the Apostle John, had committed this young guy that he had led to the Lord to a church. And you know, when John left this guy, this guy was, was really, you know, uh, looked like he was going to do great. Left him in the care of the 
the minister that was there. Well, long story short, what happened is this person ended up falling away, okay? This guy, uh, he ended up going into a lifestyle of sin that was so dark. Uh, talk about prodigal uh, son type of picture here. But um, this is the picture here. Before he went into this, the presbyter taking the youth home, educated, restrained, and cherished him at length and baptized him. So this was someone who professed Christ, was baptized. After this, he relaxed, exercising his former care and vigilance as if he had now committed him to a perfect safeguard in the seal of the Lord. But certain idle, dissolute fellows, familiar with every kind of wickedness, unhappily attached themselves to, to him, thus prematurely freed from restraints. At first they led him on by expensive entertainments, then going out at night to plunder, they take him with them. Next they encourage him to something greater and gradually becoming accustomed to their ways in his enterprising spirit, like an unbridled and powerful steed that has struck out of the right way, biting the curb, he rushed with so much of the greater wickedness towards more wickedness. At length, renouncing the salvation of God, he contemplated no trifling offense, but having committed some great crime, since he was now ruined, he expected to suffer equally with the rest. This guy was like, I'm beyond the forgiveness of God, because this, these sins are just too much. I've trusted in Christ, but now I've lived a life of, of such wickedness, there's, there's no hope for me. Taking, therefore, these same associates and forming them into a band of robbers, he became their captain, surpassing them in all violence, blood, and cruelty. This guy was in a dark spot. Time elapsed, and on a certain occasion, they sent for John, the apostle, after appointing those other matters for which he came, said, Come, bishop, return me my deposit, which I and Christ committed to thee, in the presence of the church over which you preside. The bishop at first was thinking that he's talking about some money that he owed him or something. And John was like, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I demand the young man, the soul of a brother. The old man growing, groaning heavily and also weeping said, he is dead. How and what death? He is dead to God, said he. He has turned out wicked and abandoned, and at last a robber. And now, instead of the church, he has beset the mountain with a band like himself. The apostle, hearing this, tore his garment and, beating his head with great lamentation, said, I left a fine keeper of my brother's soul. But let a horse now be got ready and someone to guide me on the way. He rode as he was away from the church and coming to the country was taken prisoner by the outguard of the bandits. He neither attempted, however, to flee nor refused to be taken, but cried out, For this very purpose am I come. Conduct me to your captain. He in the meantime stood waiting, armed as he was. But as he recognized John advancing towards him, overcame with shame, he turned about to flee. The apostle, however, pursued him with all his might, forgetful of his age, and crying out, Why dost thou fly, my son, from me thy father, thy defenseless aged father? Have compassion on me, my son, fear not, thou still hast hope of life. I will intercede with Christ for you, should it be necessary, I will cheerfully suffer death for you, as Christ has for us. I will give my life for you. Stay, believe Christ has sent me. Some of you guys right now are like, man, my son is so far gone. There's no hope for him. Right here, guys. Hearing this, he at first stopped with downcast looks. Then he threw away his arms, then trembling, lamented bitterly, and embracing the old man as he came up, attempted to plead for himself with his lamentations as much as he was able, as if baptized a second time with his own tears, and only concealing his right hand. But the apostle pledging himself and solely assuring him that he had found pardon, 
for him in his prayers at the hands of Christ, praying on his bended knees and kissing his right hand as cleansed from all iniquity, conducted him back again to the church. Then supplicating with frequent prayers, contending with constant fastings, and softening down his mind with various consolatory declarations, he did not leave him, as it is said, until he had restored him to the church, affording a powerful example of true repentance and a great evidence of a regeneration, a trophy of a visible resurrection. Guys, do not lose hope for your son. Do not lose hope for your daughter. Do not lose hope for your father. Do not lose hope for your mother. Do not lose hope for your friends. Because God them. God's love that he has placed in you is a love that, according to Corinthians 13, is patient, it's kind, it keeps no record of wrongs. It's a love that never ends. Daily, I have to go to God, and I have to say, God, I'm keeping some records of wrongs against my brother. Take care of those. Take care of those this morning. If you'll lead us in worship.